Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be back here in Warsaw. Uh, some of you people came to see me speak at uh, uh, the Warsaw Scholar User Group last year, and I spoke at Lambda Days, but I couldn't make Lambda Days this year, so I was really disappointed because uh, somebody scheduled a meeting and I had to be there. So I made sure that my next travels took place so that I could be here for this. Um, for anybody who doesn't know me, um, I'm the author of Effective ACA, which is a very cute little pamphlet about how to write uh, reactive applications with ACA. It's very small, but um, I'm also co-authoring Reactive Design Patterns with Roland Kuhn, the head of the ACA team. And uh, that's in MEEP right now, and uh, we have about 12 chapters out, so you know, if you uh, want to get a taste of what it's like, you can go to the TypeSafe site and download the first chapter and, and see what it's all about. So. One of the things that uh, I've come to realize in, in my work leading the consulting and training for TypeSafe, which is a company which really doesn't want to do consulting, um, is that Poland has extremely good developers. And in America, sometimes we don't. So, <laughs> so uh, I wondered whenever I was putting this talk together whether or not this was going to be something that the Polish audience would find as interesting, because you probably already know this. But uh, I find you know, it's always a good idea to rehash what the Java memory model is and discuss how the Java heap works so that everybody understands the dynamics of you know, all of the pointer chasing that's going to take place whenever you use things like collections in Java or Scala or whatever language. So, and then how do we protect that data? So we're going to talk about that in the next 30 minutes here. So first of all, just to sort of lay the groundwork, it's really important that we all understand that, and I'm sure we all know this, that we have more cores than we ever had before. And think about the kinds of machines that we're buying now. Um, we see people out there using 18 core boxes, which means that you can do really amazing things, like literally lock a JVM onto a specific socket, like literally just run it on the 18 cores there and get tremendous locality because now you're sharing all of the data at the L3 shared level cache, right, inside of that socket. So you get tremendous performance in doing so, right? But then if you're going to do that, how are you going to manage whether or not something you change is visible to other threads even running on that one socket, right? So we use things like, you know, locks, which are troublesome. Um, so does anybody know where locks are arbitrated? A contended lock. They're actually arbitrated in the kernel space in Linux, which means that you're running, you've got something going really fast on a core, and then it reaches a contended lock, which means that multiple threads are contending for the right to make an update at the same time. At that point, your thread will be pulled off core, and the kernel is going to arbitrate who has the right to access data. And at that point, now when you go to run, because you've been told by the kernel, hey, you can now go make this change. Well, you've got to be placed on another core. You may run on the same core, but that core was doing other stuff probably, and now your caches were all lost. So your performance really degrades whenever you have locks. So we want to avoid that. I thought this was a really good diagram for how the Java uh, JVM um, is structured. And it came from a fellow named Juan Pablo Francisconi, and uh, so I'm, I'm making sure I credit him for this. Um, the part to the far left-hand side, the method area, I want you to pretty much ignore. That's not relevant to what we're talking about here. But the heap is very critical to what we're talking about because this is where we have a monolithic space of shared memory for everything happening within a JVM. And then we have our threads on the right-hand side here. And our threads are individual stack stack machines, if you will, stacks that uh, represent method calls, right, assuming that we don't have any inlining taking place, but uh, every time you call a method, you're going to create a new stack frame and push it into the stack, and uh, that's, you know, nice, but you think about that, that implies a certain level of isolation. If you have things within a stack, it is not visible through the heap, so how can we leverage this? There are two primary concepts inside the Java memory model. There's happens before, which is when you say that if something like, you know, A happens before B, then A should also be visible to B, right? And if you've got multiple cores here, and you say that you're going to run thread one on core A and thread two on core B, but they have, 
you know, visibility to the same variable. Well, if, you know, thread one is going to update that variable, thread two may not see it unless you make guarantees about that. So one of the great things about a tool like Akka, and there are other tools like this as well, is that happens before is actually guaranteed for you. And you don't have to think about it. There are really important implications of that. If you use Akka, you know that you have a threshold, a, a limit for how many messages can be handled inside of a mailbox, right? And that's really nice, because then you can batch things. So you can say, well, handle 100 messages by this mailbox, uh, from this mailbox in this actor, before I give up my thread. And you want to give up threads, right? You want fairness to a certain degree. It just is a performance optimization. But if you did give up that thread, say you handled five messages, which is the default. You handle five of them, but there's 10 things inside the mailbox. When it goes to handle the next five, the thread that is going to be given to the actor has to see the changes that were in, you know, done by the actor on the previous messages. And so happens before is guaranteed for you. You don't have to worry about it, but if you don't use something like Akka, yes, you do. Synchronize with is a little bit different. This is where, and we know the word synchronize, right? Some people will put synchronize on a method or something like that, or, or hopefully they're really using some sort of lock object that they're creating and, and synchronizing on that so that you don't synchronize on the concept of this, the instance in Java. But this means that when you, when you make an update, it has to be flushed all the way back to RAM, all the way back, at a cost of what? Potentially 66 nanoseconds? just to flush that value back to RAM. Uh, anybody ever see those uh, you know, uh, numbers that you need to know about latency, talking about how far it is to go this far, this far, this far? They were actually kind of BS. The real numbers that you might want to know is that effectively 66 nanoseconds to go back to RAM on a you know, Sandy Bridge and newer. Um, so if you're, if, you're, if you're thinking about that in terms of clock cycles, that's roughly 180 clock cycles lost just because you had to publish something back to RAM. That stinks. So we have to use tools, right? And we know that we want to avoid locking as much as possible, so maybe we want to use things like Volatile. We'll, expl we'll, we'll talk more about what Volatile is and how we can use it effectively in a minute. So how many people have seen this slide from Joe, Ar Joe Armstrong? Wow, really? Jersey, OK. <laughs> um, so this is kind of silly. Right? It's, a, it's a very basic example of the difference between concurrency and parallelism. But what, what Joe is trying to make clear, he's the creator of Erlang, right? the actor-based uh, language uh, for you know, telephony uh, back in 1980s. Um, when you have shared mutable state of a coffee machine, you have two queues both sharing one coffee machine. And they're contending for the right to you know, get coffee from the one coffee machine. So they're alternating, possibly. It depends on the fairness rules, right? It may say five get to go, and then another five from the other line. You know, that's how you structure your program. If you have a purely parallel implementation, you don't have shared mutable state, and you, you don't have any coordination. So as a really simple example that I like to give, I like to wash dishes. Does anybody here like to wash dishes? I do. I'm, I'm silly this way. And not only do I like to wash dishes, when I'm done washing dishes, I like to put them in the dishwasher and wash them again. Does anybody else do this? Yeah. Woo. All right. I know this is a very particular neur neurosis, but uh, I, I, I like to do this. So when I'm washing dishes, I can only operate in a sequential way, right? I can, I can grab a dish. I can rinse it off. I can scrub it. I can rinse it off again, and then I can put it in the dishwasher to be washed again. But anyway. Um, but that's very sequential, right? There is no asynchrony, there is no non-blocking, there is no concurrency, and there is no parallelism because it's just one thread of execution, right? Well, what if I said to somebody who's a friend of mine, you know, come over to my house and wash dishes with me? And they say, okay, yeah, I like to wash dishes too. So, <laughs> and then they come over. And, you know, I say, all right, let's wash dishes. Here, you go. And so they go and they start washing dishes. I've spawned a process, right? We don't think of our friends like that, but I have. I've spawned work. And so this person is now washing dishes for me, and that's fantastic, right? If I stand behind them, well, then, you know, I'm blocked. I'm not doing anything else. But it's also kind of rude, right? 
because I'm, I'm, I'm wasting a thread that could be doing something useful, but no, I'm just standing there uselessly behind them while they work. And assuming they don't get mad and leave, you know, that will continue until they're done. Or maybe I could go get a, get a beer, or I could go play with my kids or something like that. Well, okay, great. I've spawned work. I'm now non-blocking because I'm doing something else, but I'm asynchronous. That's fantastic. Well then, what if I said I want to work with this person? What if I wanted to work at the same time as them? And that would work too, right? We could say, all right, well, let's spawn a, a pipeline of work where you get to um, you know, grab the dish and rinse it off and then scrub it, and I'll do the rinsing and putting it in the dishwasher or something like that. Well, that's great, but now we are contending in multiple ways. Uh, for the rinsing at the beginning and at the end, we both have to have access to a faucet, and there may be only one. We have contention on the dish. I may be waiting for somebody to hand me the dish as it works its way down, right? So this is all concurrent issues. If we were purely parallel, we would have our own sinks, our own faucets, and our own set of dishes to do work. And that's where we want to be, to be as efficient as possible. Minimizing the amount of coordination and minimizing the amount of shared mutable state and contention. So let's break down how variables are structured inside of the JVM. And one of the crazy thing, not crazy thing, so Rich Hickey had this talk a couple years ago. Did anybody hear this one? It was called Identity and, and Values and, uh, and State, Time. Uh, so a couple people. Um, it was a really, really great talk, but when Rich started, he said, I don't want to talk about this from the perspective of the JVM. I just want to talk about the, the concepts that I'm discussing here. And it was really good. I highly recommend you look it up. But I, I really struggled because I didn't want to use the words identity and value and, 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 and overload what Rich was talking about. But then I couldn't think of a better word than value. It really expresses the, 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 the value <laughs> that uh, is, is what you're trying to look at, right? But then the name itself is just a pointer. When they created Java, they said they weren't going to use the word pointer because they were deathly afraid that somebody would think they could do pointer arithmetic. So they called everything references and said Java doesn't have pointers, which is an utter lie. Java is full of pointers and they're everywhere. So in Scala, when we create a, you know, a val, this is a purely immutable pointer to a value. And what we don't see here is whether the person type is immutable itself. That's kind of worrisome. We said this is a val. Does that mean anything about whether someone can change person, the instance of person that we have there? No. So how do we make guarantees about this? Let's just look at what it looks like inside of the heap itself. Because this is a class, and this is a field at the top level of the class, it can be shared by multiple threads, right? So the pointer for me is right here inside of my heap, pointing to another place where the actual value is stored for the person. Okay, great. But if I have multiple threads who can see me, and somebody's changing that value inside a person, well, I have a couple of problems. First of all, who can do it when? And who can see what when? Okay. It gets a lot hazier when you start thinking about collections. So, all right, I've got me still, right? And it's a val, and it's a person with my name. Uh, and then I've got other, which is another instance of person with my wife's name. And, okay, then I say that I'm creating a list. And, by the way, I really apologize for the semicolons there. This is what happens when you take a Java presentation and turn it into Scala. <laughs> but I'm creating an instance of a list that is us. Right? And it's going to have the pointers for me and other inside of it. It's not the values, it's the pointers. So that means that when I define me, I've got you know, a reference to a person that's you know, my name. And then for the other, it's a person with my wife's name. But then I look at the list implementation, and this is actually incorrect. Again, I used a Java presentation which was doing an array list where the values were going to be contiguous. In a, you know, Scala list, you're actually talking about a linked list. These are not necessarily contiguous in memory. I mean, that's, that's scary to think about the amount of indirection that you're actually talking about. And this is just the Java implementation representation. I should have redone this, I'm embarrassed. But I still have the reference to the list 
which is going to have references inside of it that have to be pointed to, which then point to the actual values. And when you hear people like Martin Thompson complain about the performance of pointer chasing, you know, in particular with collections, this is what he means. It's, it's painful from a performance perspective. When we're talking about a method local variable, then we have slightly different semantics. And, and the great thing about it is it does imply a certain level of thread safety, only because the thread is the only one that has the handle to the me instance. In my stack frame is where that pointer is living, not inside of the heap. And therefore, while the value person is you know, still in the heap and somebody else could see it, they don't have a reference to it and you don't have to worry about it at all. So in Java, we have the final keyword, which is great if you remember to put it in there. I literally, in uh, one client that I worked at, uh, we had a save action for our Eclipse setup that every time you saved, it would make everything final, just so that you didn't forget, which you know sometimes was annoying, but you appreciated it when you had to deal with thread safety issues. Scala makes you choose at the point of creation whether you're using a val or a var. So you're thinking about thread safety from the outset. That's good. But still, if you make something final or you make it a val, it says nothing about what can change on the right-hand side of the equals. You only have stability on the left-hand side. So let's look at the mutability matrix of pain. And I came up with this from all the trainings I was doing about you know, how to learn Scala and trying to express to people, especially those who are new to the JVM, how this works. And on the left-hand dimension, we're going to have the left-hand side of the equals, the name. And we have var and we have val, right? And then at the top here, the dimension is value, what's on the right-hand side of the equals. And there we have mutable data and immutable data. If you're sitting with a var of mutable data, you are going to get shocked when you're in a multi-threaded world because you are neither protecting the reference nor the data inside of it. So you are definitely going to be, you know, dealing with visibility issues and synchronization issues. If you're a val of mutable data, well, okay, nobody can change my pointer. I'm still always going to be pointing to the same place, but what's inside there can be updated in place, which is dangerous, right? So anytime we're in either one of these places, we have to lock. The lock is not only going to say who can change what when, but it's also going to give the happens before guarantee. Great. If we are in this var of immutable data, we are in a world of snapshots. It means that I'm never looking at anything that isn't immutable, but I can change my reference to stuff. So you make an update to my person, okay, well I get a new instance of a person that I can now reference, right? I can, I can have my pointer set to look at that other memory space, which is sort of the fundamental structure of how we do things like structural sharing for functional data collections. In this space, you have volatile. And volatile is a very powerful tool. It's for memory barriers, right? I'll explain them more in a second. If you have val of immutable, then you are in the perfect place. You are in a world that is completely thread safe because neither the reference nor the value can ever be updated. This is where we want to be. This is where we'll be successful in a multi-threaded world. But there are implications about this. Let's just think about garbage collection, right? Um, in the generational garbage collection world of the JVM, we have our Eden, our new gen. We have our, our survivor spaces, zero and one, which is sort of where we spill things out from new gen whenever they're uh, you know, living long enough to not be collected immediately. And then things get promoted into old gen eventually, which is where we see the greatest latency for compaction, for stop the world pauses whenever a whole bunch of data needs to be collected. Um, we know there's an effective limit inside of the JVM of roughly four gigabytes in size because, you know, for heap, because if we go above that and we use something like a current mark sweep or G1, you are going to get long pauses. And you can tell a garbage collector that there is a max pause length, but it will not listen to you. 
It won't. You could say, I don't want my pauses any longer than one second. And then you think, yeah, all right, I set that. Woo. No. Because the, you never want to interrupt threads on a JVM, do you? That leads to instability. So they don't either. <laughs> All right, so if you're going to use immutable data, you're going to have more short-lived stuff. And that's going to impact your, you know, new gen. Because every new gen collection is going to be stop the world. And there's nothing you can do about that. You can't change your new gen collector to use something that's parallel or something like that. It doesn't happen. So, you fill up new gen, great. Whenever it's filled, it's got to take stuff and put it into survivor. But, it's got to stop the world to do so. And if you make new gen larger because you're creating more short-lived stuff, well, that means your pause is also going to be longer. And the other implication of that is that you may not size your survivor and, and, and old gen threshold ratios, all that fun stuff, such that things don't just automatically spill over immediately to old gen, which you probably didn't want for things that weren't going to live forever, right? There is a push right now inside of uh, you know, the mechanical sympathy world to have an annotation that says, I want this to be something I can declare it's a long-lived value, and it will automatically go to old gen. I don't know if that'll ever get implemented, but it's a push right now, and hopefully it will. Because then you could say, this is something I want to declare, something don't even worry about, just push it all the way out to old gen, done. Wouldn't that be great? So whenever you're thinking about how you're going to resize your new gen and your old gen, you know, how you're gonna deal with all this extra garbage you're creating, don't just do it without looking first at what the costs are. Benchmark, you know, one of the great things about the last talk by Radek was that he showed he was using something called JMH, Java Micro Benchmarking Harness, which is a wonderful tool for doing benchmarks. Do use them, figure out what the cost is whenever you're doing work with large amounts of garbage. Interestingly, most of the customers I run into don't know Java you know, JVM flags at all. Um, I don't want to call out companies, but let's face it, they, there's a certain amount of black magic inside of JVM tuning. You have to really know your stuff. And that's specific to the individual collectors that you're using as well. G1 is a great new collector, and everybody says you don't have to do any tuning on it. Well, believe it or not, there are still a lot of options. And if you don't know them, you don't know what to do with them. Well, most people I run into, they're actually fine. They're like, wow, this performance is so much better than what I was doing before just using Play Framework or Akka or something like that, they don't even care. They're like, woo, we won. <laughs> but if you really, really care about latency, you are going to want to fight this battle a little bit. Um, so use immutable collections, and Java does have this now. That's kind of exciting, right? You, you can use the collections dot, you know, immutable set, collections dot immutable, you know, list or something like that. And yay, Java, you caught up a little bit. But you know what? That's only a wrapper. They're not like Scala collections, which are guaranteed immutable all the way down, right? You don't get that from Java. It's really actually mutable still in the heap. It's just a wrapper around it that makes, no, it doesn't expose a way to set a value. That's, you know, okay, better, but still. Um, and then when we have mutability and we're using snapshots, we want to use the volatile keyword. But the important thing about volatile is knowing where to use it. So for example, say I have three fields, first name, middle name, and last name inside of my class. Do I want to make every single one of those fields volatile? Anyone? No, right? Unless I have to update them individually. If I have a method that is going to say, you know, change name and takes all three values, what you want to do is make the last one volatile. This is something you might actually want to put inside of your code because somebody else is going to come in there and they're going to add another field like, you know, a suffix, like, you know, you're a junior or a senior or something like that. Um, and they're not going to know that the last field was volatile and understand that, you know what, the change to the last one that they just added is now not published. What volatile is going to do is put a memory barrier in place such, such that when the field is updated, it's going to publish it to all of the other threads. You don't want to pay that cost for the update of every single field. So you batch them. You say update first name, update middle name, update last name, and because last name was volatile, that one results in the publishing of all of them. On the flip side, the other thread that's going to do reading of this shared state, you want to make sure you read the last name first so that you are guaranteeing the read barrier before you read 
the other fields which weren't protected. So make sure that you get that correct. Make sure that you comment it so that anybody who comes into your code who doesn't know what they're doing doesn't accidentally mess it up. There is a possibility on the JVM that you may see updates to fields, you know, just by pure happenstance. And the reason is because of the, the underlying protocol for how cores share data. Anybody know what MESI plus F is? It's a protocol that is used for sharing data on cache lines between cores all the way from L1, L2, L3. There's even an L4 for data now. Um, back to main memory. That's the unit of currency, as Martin Thompson calls it, for how data is shared between all these cores. And it can have multiple fields on it. So if it just so happens that first name and middle name were on the same cache line, and you, you had, I'm sorry, first name and last name were on the same cache line, and you didn't use publishing, but somehow one of the fields was updated and that one was, was happens before somehow, the other one also gets published with it. This is a bad example. If you, have la if you have first name on a cache line, and you have no control over this, if you have first name on a cache line with something that was published, but not last name, something else in some other class, some other field, it doesn't matter. But it gets published, another thread might see the update to first name. And if you have concerns about the ordering of visibility, then maybe you need stronger you know, control. This is the caveat I'm mentioning here. If you need greater consistency guarantees, then use them. There are additional tools, but to get to them, you have to use SunMisk Unsafe. And anybody who goes into SunMisk Unsafe world knows that this is uh, where the dragons are in the JVM. If you open up that package, make sure that you're just using what you're using and, and understand the read barrier, understand the write barrier well. Try to use, you know, VARs of immutable data when you have shared mutable state. Understand the dynamics of how you have to update those values to make sure that the visibility is guaranteed. And uh, that's it. <laughs>